Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. In this, our sixth panel, we will hear from a variety of expert practitioners and academics who will discuss soft education, authorities, doctrine, and special challenges. This panel is moderated by Colonel Patrick Howell. Colonel Howell holds a PhD from Duke University and also served in the 75th Ranger Regiment and the Joint Special Operations Command. His most recent position was as the, the director of the Modern War Institute at West Point. Colonel Howell will now guide the discussion on the research question, what adjustments to education, authorities, and doctrine need to be made to help SOF overcome the special challenges of the future? Colonel Howell, sir, the floor is yours. All right, thanks, Charlie. As, uh, as Charlie said, my name is Pat Howell, and somewhat tongue-in-cheek, I am the Director Emeritus of the Modern War Institute at West Point. I handed the reins over uh, to Colonel Pat Sullivan about two months ago. Uh, however, before serving as the MWI Director, I was I led the strategic planning cell in the JSOC J55 down at Fort Bragg. Uh, before I forget, I'd also like to thank Dr. Ike Wilson and the JSOC staff and faculty for putting on this conference. And I'm also going to put the normal disclaimer that uh, the statements being made by the speakers are expressing their personal views and do not necessarily necessarily represent their parent organization, JSAL, SOCOM, or the Department of Defense. Uh, as I said before, I'm a planner, and as a planner, I, I developed a very simple, silly and simple formula that posited that all strategies, plans, and policies are a function of facts and assumptions. If that silly formula is true, then it goes to follow that when the facts and assumptions of an organization change, the organization should probably change its plans, policies, or strategies. And that's why I can appreciate the purpose and the intent of this conference. It's always good for an organization to, to stop for a moment, take a step back, and re-examine itself to look at the facts and assumptions that undergird uh, what it's doing. And whilst I think it's fairly obvious that we are witnessing a, ch a change in the strategic environment, which implies that SOF will need to change as well. What's not obvious is how SOF should change. And that's why the, the, conference, uh, the conference question of what kinds of personnel capabilities, authorities, mission sets, equipment, and doctrine will best prepare American SOF to su succeed in the fourth age of special operations. That question is the driving, is the driving force for this conference. Uh, and this conference is a forum to consider, debate, and explore some answers to that question. One great value of doing personal or doing virtual conferences, maybe the silver lining to COVID is that we've learned how to do a lot more stuff virtually, which lets us cast a much wider net on who we can bring in to give to comment and give their thoughts uh, and, and, and contribute to the debate and discussion. It's a lot easier to, to die in to uh, dial into a Zoom meeting for an hour and a half than it is to fly halfway across the country for two days. Uh, and for me, this conference, to me, as, as, I, as we looked at this panel, uh, I, I like to figure out how this panel was nesting with the rest of the conference. And I sort of think it's breaking down into uh, to four, four distinct sections. Yesterday was really more externally focused. Was yesterday morning kicking off with the history of the evolution of soft leading up to what this fourth age is and uh, how we've reached an inflection point. And yesterday afternoon was looking at how soft as a force can have effects how they can create dilemmas and challenges for our adversary, adversaries, particularly in the world of IW. Today's conference seems to be more internally focused, more on how SOF can achieve those effects. Later this afternoon, we're going to focus on how we work with allies and partners, particularly in integrated defense as well as gray zone operations. Whereas this morning, uh, where, where, well, yesterday looked at so, how SOF can have an effect, this morning is looking more internal looking and, and asking the question, uh, asking specifically, how or what soft can do uh, in order to have that effect. This with the first panel being what is defining the soft professional and this one more is the dot mill PF realm of looking at doctrine, authorities and education. And which is, as Charlie said, are the question that we're, this panel adjust, is, is addressing is what adjustments to education, authorities and doctrine do we need to make to help soft overcome the special challenges of the future? And I got to give credit to Mike Kellington from the last panel. He had a great, uh, great final comment, which is, uh, why, why can a lieutenant colonel have the authority to put a warhead on a forehead halfway across the world, but it takes a general officer to approve a tweet or a leaflet to go out? So to help, to help uh, talk about this question, we have four august speakers. First off is Lieutenant Colonel Keith Carter. Keith is a United States Army officer currently stationed at the United States Military Academy at West Point. He is the director of the Defense and Strategic Studies Program. His last operational assignment was at in the JSOC J55, where he was the lead of the strategic planning cell in the J55. 
Prior to that, he commanded an infantry battalion at Fort Campbell as a part of the 101st. A uh, lifelong infantryman, he has had multiple tours in a variety of infantry and ranger units. As a chief of staff of the Army Advanced Strategic Plans and Policy Program fellow, Keith earned his doctorate in political science from the University of Pennsylvania. Lieutenant Colonel Tim Heck. Tim Heck is the deputy, or is, uh, is, has a split personality here. He's the de on, on most days, he's the deputy editorial director for the Modern War Institute at West Point. As, an, as a Marine reservist, he's an artillery uh, artilleryman and a regional affairs officer. Uh, he's a veteran of both Iraq and Afghanistan. He has previously served in the SOCOM Ford JCT, and he writes on Soviet military history, amphibious operations, the operational art of the Cold War. At West Point, he teaches courses in the Defense and Strategic Studies program. Third up, Lieutenant Colonel Christian Simon is in, uh, has been in the Army, U.S. Army for 22 years, seven of which as a Western Hemisphere Foreign Area Officer. He spent two years at WinSEC as an instructor, two and a half years at the U.S. Embassy in Nicaragua as an Assistant Army Attaché, two and a half years in the Joint Staff J-5, and four years at, uh, in the Office of Secretary of Defense on the Western Hemisphere team. Last but definitely not least is Captain Moriamo Solomon Eiffel-Lodon. I apologize for, for doing the name wrong. She is currently serves as a public affairs officer since she's dialing in from East Europe. So if you don't see her, it's because we have some bandwidth issues. As a prior service enlisted imagery analyst, her, her first unit in combat tour with, was with the First Special Forces Group. As an experienced military intelligence and public affairs officer, Mo has a demonstrated history of working across all ranks, echelons, and communities. Mo is a published author and holds a Master of Professional Studies in Public Relations and Corporate Communications from Georgetown University. Mo is currently located in Romania as part of ongoing operations. When it comes for her turn for comments, uh, I ask that she give us a quick rundown of what she's doing. I'm sure it'd be of interest to the, to the crowd. Now, what we're going to do is I'm going to hand the, hand the mic over to the various members of the panel for their, their opening, uh, opening talk or comments. And after which I will do the exercise moderator's prerogative and ask each one of them one or two directed questions. And after that, I'll take we'll take questions from the uh, from the moderator uh, from the that's coming from the audience. So with that, I'm going to hand it over to uh, Keith Carter. Keith, over to you. Sir, uh, thank you very much for that introduction. And I'd just like to thank uh, you know uh, Jay Sal for hosting this panel. Um, obviously, I, in my current position as the director of the Defense and Strategic Studies Program up here at West Point, uh, I spent a lot of my time thinking about uh, academic curriculum and the types of training and educational experiences we need to, uh, you know, use to bring in the next generation of, you know, company-grade officers to the force. And as I've thought through some of the, you know, adjustments in the curriculum, as I looked at the Defense and Strategic Studies Program, you know, I have been kind of, uh, you know, I think a lot about the the distinction between training and education. And I think this is a distinction that really does inform this panel. And it's one that often gets conflated uh, at PME, which is, uh, you know, ostensibly stands for professional military education, but oftentimes looks a lot more like training. And the difference between the two is that in training, obviously you can do sets and repetitions of the same task repeatedly building proficiency uh, whereas education is, I think, more broadly an uh, exposure to different disciplinary perspectives. Um, and so we, we're, we're actually afforded very few opportunities on an education in education over the course of our careers. Um, you know, everybody gets an undergrad, every officer gets undergraduate education. We obviously encourage undergraduate education for many of our non-commissioned officers. But that's about it until you get to the War College, because I would even say that the majority of CGSC actually constitutes training, training specifically in the mission decision making process. And I think that as warfare has advanced, uh, you know, beyond the industrial age and into the information age, where we've seen this growing complexity, uh, this sort of blending of the distinction between peace and war, and this, uh, you know, increased uh, awareness of and operations within the cyber and the space domain. Uh, you know, education is going to take, uh, you know, sort of the first place among the two um, between education and training. And so as I'm uh, like talking to my future officers, one of the things that I'm interested in, right, because you can train someone disciplinary with dis in disciplinary perspectives like political science, mechanical, mechanical engineering, all of the traditional departments. But what's really important, I think, for, uh, you know, young uh, undergraduates looking to become military officers is that you have uh, wherewithal in terms of data analysis, 
the research design process and how to map uh, assessments. And as I have looked back on sort of my own operational experience in both Iraq and Afghanistan, you know, I think that as we gain some perspective on our uh, performance in those conflicts, uh, we're going to realize that one of the things that went poorly was our own assessment strategy. Uh, and everybody, I'm sure, in this this group has familiarity with campaign plans and the uh, very elaborate spreadsheets that you know we designed to assess our performance while campaigning. And you know, a lot of those a lot of those became uh, self reinforcing. They were tautological, and um, they didn't actually give us a good assessment of the progress we were making as evidence by you know sort of the failure to achieve our major objectives in both the Iraq and Afghanistan campaign. And I think that if we had had uh, officers that were more steeped, uh, if the military was more attuned to uh, sort of empirical research strategies and, you know, uh, epistemological like methodology, uh, we would have done maybe more rigorous assessments. Um, and so that is very much where my mind is as I look toward uh, the curriculum within my you know, program and how I'm instructing these future commission officers. And that concludes my opening remarks. Thanks, Keith. Hey, Keith. Um, well, I'm, I will have a directed question later on. One quick observation, one that I homed in on was your uh, your uh, thought that the importance of data analysis and research design, uh, putting on a doctrine, doctrinaire hat, it makes me go back to the the process of uh, understanding, you know, the number one, number one step is understanding a problem. If we can't understand the problem, if we can't get the facts and assumptions right, we're not going to get the plan right. And so uh, you seem to be emphasized if we re reinforcing that, if we have to get better at understanding problems and these are, and you offer up the data analysis and research design as a way to help, help us understand, over. Yes, sir, I think that's it specifically. And I think a lot of the times we spend a lot of time trying to get the question right, you know, specifically as it pertains to like the design process. And ultimately, I think we need to go back to first principles. We need to ask good questions, and then we need to identify what sort of evidence would either confirm or fail to confirm the hypothesis we have uh, that have informed that question. And I think that, you know, I mean, there's like a, obviously a use of the scientific method that we see uh, that has applicability to, uh, you know, military assessments uh, for operations. But I think in general, the other thing, obviously, that we're seeing is... Um, in an information age environment, the proliferation of data is just, uh, it's been exponentially increasing throughout my career, throughout your career. Uh, when we came in as, you know, young officers, uh, you know, data analytics wasn't nearly what it is today. Uh, the volume and the amount of data that we have is going to necessitate uh, that military officers have uh, data analysis skill sets so that they can meaningfully look at the patterns in the data ask empirically driven questions that support their commander's uh, critical information requirements and provide answers that are backed uh, by firm empirical measurement. Over. Great, thanks, Keith. Uh, let's head over to uh, Tim Heck. You got the mic. Thank you, sir. So my background is with, with SOF is as an enabler. I was at SOCOM FMDJCT as a reservist for three years. Um, and I saw, you know, when we talk about the, the generation of the fourth generation of soft, that the, the gap that exists in our education process is in professionalizing that staff and the enablers. We have, you know, to use Colonel Carter's words, we have lots of good training courses that are coming out of JSAL, but they're training courses. We have the staff education foundations course, which I took when I was at SOCOM. We don't have the next step. And I think that's where we're, we're doing a disservice to our to our commanders because we're not providing a professionalized and systematized educational progression for those enablers and for that support staff, right? If you're a Green Beret, if you're a Navy SEAL, if you're MARSOC, if you're AFSOC, you've got your, your professional pipeline. Oh, sorry, Colonel Carter, a Ranger, Colonel Howell as well. Uh, you know, you're in that pipeline. You've got those trainings, you've got those skill sets. If you're like me and you're working in you know, not even a J shop, but this kind of amalgamation of a thing, there's needs to be an extended, an expanded process of staff education. Since I took the course in 2015, the course has evolved and changed looking at the course catalog. I think that's a good thing. 
but what's next, right? The one week course or the, the two week asynchronous course that our enablers and that our staff shows up and receives on their initial day shouldn't be the only level of staff education that they get for the next 20 years of their civilian career, if they're a civilian or whatever their rotation is, you know, at SOCOM, you know, knowing that a lot of our folks go, leave SOCOM, go to a TSOC, go to, you know, RSOC or AFSOC or wherever and come back. So we have an opportunity to professionalize staff and enable our education uh, that I think is being overlooked right now. Uh, and that goes to education that some of which is training, but most of it is an educational gap there. The next thing that I see to better enable the fourth generation of SOF is improve support to the civilian staff, right? In FMDJCT, a lot of contractors when I was there, most of which were dual hatted, right? They were reservists, they were retired SF or retired uh, Special Operations Forces folks. So they had a working knowledge of what was going on. But if we want to make the Joint Special Operations University and, and the Joint Special Operations concept more joint, we need to improve access for civilians, specifically for the interagency, right? This is where a whole of government approach, we, we talk about it in a lot of our doctrine, we talk about it in a lot of the, you know, the policy briefs and the statements, and certainly in the classes that we teach here, hey, there's got to be a whole of government approach. But I think to, to go back to what Colonel Carter said earlier, Afghanistan taught us that maybe we weren't doing it right. And so if we're going to be running a joint special operations university, if we're going to professionalize our civilian staff, we have to focus on bringing in that interagency perspective and not assuming a baseline of existing knowledge. The third thing I see is our support to the reservists. As a reservist, we bring a lot, you know, I'd like to say we bring a lot to the table. Um, and while your traditional view of the reserves is one week in a month, two weeks a year, uh, there's a lot of us that are doing things that are beneficial to the soft community in our day jobs. Finding ways for us to, for SOCOM or, or the, the component commands to leverage that is important. And finding ways to educate and train, to educate, not to train, but to educate that staff uh, as to what the reserves can bring to you is important. The, the support goes both ways though. There has to be improved support to the reservists. JSAL currently in its offerings has some online courses. I've taken the National Resistance course remotely. It was fantastic. Three days, a great course. At the unclassified level, most of the courses at JSAL, I believe could be taught and that will improve your access and the proliferation of that information and knowledge to the reservists who can't necessarily come to Fort Bragg or Camp Lejeune. Offering them asynchronous gives us an opportunity to participate in the continued growth and development of our skill sets in such a way that fits with the rest of our lives. You know, one of the things that I tell my Marines, hey, you've got to sort out the other 28 days of the month first. And so unfortunately, things fall off the back burner. And if I don't have the ability to get to, this, to a course, I'm just not going to take it. But if I can do it remotely after the kid goes to sleep, nights, weekends, you know, on my lunch break, I'm going to gain more out of it. So that support to the reserve component is going to be crucial, I think, to enabling soft operations in the future as well. Sir, back to you. Okay, thanks, Timmy. One quick observation. Um, this is from your second point about uh, improving support to the civilian staff. There's a there's a body of literature, and, I, and I, I wish I can remember, I can't give the citation, but I can't remember where I read it, but I've, I have read it. There's a body of literature that shows that organizations tend to make better decisions when they have a greater variety of perspectives in the decision-making process. So you avoid, avoid the group thing. And it seems that you seem to be suggesting something similar for the JSL, for the JSL instructors if we have if the if the body of instructors from JSL represent a far greater uh, represent a greater and I and I don't know what the current spread is I'm just speaking hypothetically a, a greater representation across services and the interagency that in turn will have a downstream effect of providing more variety of perspectives to the student uh, to the students. That Absolutely, sir. So I'll use my time with the Department of State. Uh, when I was at the embassy in Bangkok, we had elements from across the services there, a, a, a rather robust US military presence. It was the first time many of them in, had worked with the Department of State. You know, I see, you know, looking at the panelists today, we have some folks that are working at JSAL that come from USAID, that come from state. There should be more. You know, you see uh, NPS has a Homeland Security, uh, I believe it's a, a, a master's program that's available. 
that the, the DHS helps run and train, JSAO has an opportunity to do something like that too, especially when we talk about soft support to civil authorities. Um, and worldwide, again, there are soft elements at our embassies and consulates around the world. Soft teams are going into country and having to interact with country teams before they go to do their training, their JSET or whatever it is. There's an opportunity to broaden the experience of, of both the, you know, the practitioner, but also the staff in understanding the interagency process and, and, and how that, that nests, sir. Thanks, Tim. As you're talking, I had a, a somewhat tongue-in-cheek, somewhat humor, humorous saying. So, uh, if we if we rely on one way to bring in perspectives to hire folks that have retired from the service, that it's, they're still serving, but maybe you know due to bad backs and bad bad knees, are not active duty, but they can still they still contribute with their mind. To we can the joke to put it in joking sense, we we change the no colonel and sergeant major plan, no colonel and sergeant major left behind plan to the no colonel sergeant major. Foreign Service Officer, CIA Case Officer, et cetera, left behind to bring those experiences into, uh, into an educational environment so they can have a downstream effect on students. Um, okay, thank you, Tim. Next up, we're going to go to uh, Chris. Over to you. Hello, good morning, sir. Uh, thank you, sir, and thank you to Jay Sao for hosting this event. I have to say it's an honor to be here. Uh, so I want to caveat my perspectives uh, in that I've only been focused on the Western Hemisphere for roughly the last 17 years. So I'm a little bit uh, a little bit close to the forest to see the trees. Um, so from a .mil PF perspective, uh, I think we would be well served to remember that partner engagement is a soft skill. Uh, in and of itself, and sending our service members uh, to exchanges with regional partners has multiple benefits, uh, not just uh, drinking capuarinas on the beach or Pisco Sours in Peru. Um, the attitude largely uh, uh, from, from what I've seen over the last bit of my military service was that if you speak the language, you're good. But I think in the broader, broader context that misses culture, background, and context, uh, and as an example, it was just brought up in Afghanistan. Yeah, we could tell the Afghanis what we wanted them to do, and we could ask them to do stuff, or we could hear their needs. But without a broader, a broader context, uh, we missed kind of the sub, the socio-political context of what was really going on. So, um, the the thing about the Western Hemisphere and and, and our perspective vis-a-vis -vis or relative to the development of SOF uh, in the future is that we have to remember we're not alone, uh, not just here, but worldwide. And in the Western Hemisphere specifically, integration of intelligence activities uh, into SOF is partners have recognized uh, that accurate time and, and timely targeting uh, using the full spectrum of, in, of intel activities is more effective than kinetic action alone. Um, and the, the best case would, for that would be uh, the Pablo Escobar episode in, in Colombia. Once once that success was achieved, um, that was a uh, there was a model that wanted to be they wanted to replicate in the rest of the hemisphere. It's also important, I think, uh, for the Western Hemisphere to recognize that the United States' role in the hemisphere has changed, especially since 2004, when the then Secretary of State publicly rejected the Monroe Doctrine. Uh, I don't know if the rest of the audience is familiar, but the Monroe Doctrine basically stated, hey. Uh, the United States is more or less in charge of the security of the hemisphere. Um, and we will view foreign interference in the hemisphere as interference with the United States. In 2004, we said, nope, we're done. We're no longer the bad guy. You can't blame us. And uh, great power competition adversaries saw that as an invitation uh, to push and pursue uh, Belt and Road Initiative type events. So our regional partners, they're routinely underfunded. And uh, that's kind of, uh, that's, that's a, a pretty hard drawback, right? That's a hard line. If they're underfunded by themselves, uh, then what can we do to help? Because soft development in the Western hemisphere, it leverages intelligence as a force multiplier and it enables decisive actions. Basically help them to do what we need from our partners for regional security. Um, and put another way, and I hate to be jingoistic or, or cliche, but SOF enables our partners to do more with less. So I would posit that uh, given this reality, Western Hemisphere is actually a perfect test bed for US assistance in soft training and doctrine development. We have ready partners who are largely culturally aligned, and uh, we've already seen significant advances in regional security where they're deployed and employed. Um, 
So I would say that we need to question our cultural narcissism within how we are developing our forces. Uh, and we need to, to look a little bit deeper uh, as to the value of the soft skills that soldiers and um, operators gain when they do the training downrange with our partners. It's not just language. I mean, <laughs> anyone who's had to deal with a foreign partner understands that there's so much more going on than just talking the talk. Um, so if you don't understand the socio-political context, the socio-cultural context, uh, then yeah, it's great that you can speak it, but you don't really understand it. I yield. All right, thanks, Chris. Um, quick question for you, more of a side note, but uh, I liked your opening part about language versus cultural awareness. On a complete side and personal note, I'm on the dissertation committee for Colonel Frank Sobchak, who is doing his dissertation up at the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy, assessing the importance of language skills for special, for, uh, special forces groups. Um, he does not need to make any changes. He defends next week, so... Uh, uh, just throwing that out as a, as a as a humorous note. Now, let me ask you this question. I think you mentioned this in a previous email. If you were king for the day, what educational opportunity would you direct that we do? You had you had an interesting one from an earlier conversation. And, and uh, thank you, sir. Uh, but as a specific vignette, uh, the our partner nations they routinely offer us courses. Uh, Brazil, Colombia, etc. They offer up their courses, which we routinely do not fill. Uh, and the it has a double-edged or triple-edged effect. There are follow-on effects. The partner, one, feels rejected. Two, uh, we imply, either explicitly or implicitly, that we do not value the level of training that our partners could, could provide. Three, we miss out on the opportunity to engage with the future leaders of our partner nations uh, and, to, and to establish those one-on-one -on -one bona fides of like, hey, I, I am not a proud graduate of the Ranger School, but my understanding is that uh, it is formative for many of our leaders and you establish bonds, link, links with your fellow rangers, your ranger buddies uh, that last well beyond the course itself. We are missing that opportunity when we decline the, the schools that our partners offer us. Uh, and people, uh, I, I've asked why specifically we do this. People say, oh, well, the people who are qualified and we can guarantee to get through the course, they're they're old and they don't want to suck. They they don't want to have to grind it out through another school. Well, maybe if we change the paradigm to say, all right, uh, honor graduate from Bullock or honor graduate from whatever school, uh, you speak the language. Congratulations, you have an opportunity to excel. And the flip side of this question is that um, where we are routinely bypassing or, or declining the opportunities that our partners are giving us within the region. Um, the great power competition competitors um, are not. They are, pump, they are pumping as many people into the pipeline as they can. And as a result, um, yeah, there is a, there's a follow-on effect of GPC influence uh, within the uh, graduating class of every single course that we decline to attend, outsize, an outsize influence. Yeah, thanks, Chris. Um, quick, a quick, uh, quick question. Then we'll go to before we go to Mo. Or quick, one question, one observation. For your your King of Freedom Day recommendation, would this be pushing for? Is this soft only attending more courses, or all branches, all services attending more courses? And then the, and the the observation is, and you also seem to be recommending that we push this earlier in a career, as opposed to you can't do this until you're a senior major and you've done the following five wickets before you can have this opportunity. Over. Yes, sir. Uh, well, uh, I think to address specifically, uh, I would say the sooner the better. Uh, I would say, why do we have to sell ourselves short in the process? Um, and part of the beauty uh, of the soft. Um, community is that they invest in their people. They realize that, you know, we may not need this skill right now, but when we need the skill, we're going to, you cannot develop soft after the fact. You can't say, oh, I need a platoon of people who speak uh, Brazilian Portuguese. You, that has to happen before the bang. Uh, and if we are going to look at the broader context of how do we amplify our skill sets uh, to more effectively engage with 
both the region and the world, uh, we need to look at investing uh, or expanding investment in our people. And and people will say, oh well, there's there's no bang for the buck. Uh, wh I, where do I put this on an ORB or an ERB? Well, the the bang for the buck uh, is more than just a line. It's more than just checking a block on a, a PME development. That's I know that sounds nebulous, but that's my opinion. Thanks, Chris. And last but not least, Mo, we're going to hand it over to you. And uh, if you could just do quick at the beginning, give us a quick recap of what what you're doing as a PAO in Romania. And I uh, I'm excited to have you here because again, Mike Kelvington brought up the great point of the Lieutenant Colonels could put warheads and foreheads, but it takes a general officer to approve a PAO message. Over. <laughs> Yes, sir. Um, good morning or afternoon. I think it's morning over there. Good morning, everyone, Colonel Howell and members of JSAL and guests. Thank you for thinking of me and inviting me onto this panel discussion. Um, I am Captain Moriamo Salaman Efeld, and you did do, do a great job, sir, um, in pronouncing my name. Um, and as stated, I'm a public affairs officer for Deployed in um, Romania. And so as a public affairs team leader, I manage two public affairs teams here in Romania and Bulgaria. And what I do is I coordinate all public affairs activities in both Romania and Bulgaria with the respective um, ministries of defense, the units, like the conventional units that are in both locations, NATO partners and allies, and any media um, that may request to come on post and talk with our, our soldiers. Now, um, I have had quite a, a myriad of full and rich experiences in my tenure career, fruitful, rewarding um, part of my career and challenging, but it was all within the soft community in the first part of my career. Um, I never knew what the, being part of the community meant and what being part of the brotherhood meant, um, but uh, I will speak on the education, on the special challenges piece and the education piece, as well as the um, IW piece, um, because that is my passion. Um, as previously stated, I'm classically trained MI, but um, information and the information domain is kind of like my baby and it's my, it's what I love to do. Um, before that though, I would do want to say that I am an introvert and it's weird speaking on such a large and pre prestigious forum as this. Um, and that has kind of been a challenge. Um, thinking and internalizing and analyzing problem sets before moving forward has always posed to be a challenge when it is always sometimes a hurry up and make a decision. Kind of like it takes a, jet, a flag officer to approve a, a PAO message. Um, but there, there are some method to the madness. Um, another challenge that I felt was um, I have this insane thirst for knowledge and I felt like there was no formal education for support bubbas like me and to pretty much learn the basics of how soft softs. Um, I'm not from a um, military family so coming in and first group bring my first unit is like what is all of this? I don't even know what any of this means. And I didn't know JSAL was even a thing. Um, so I do believe education is foundational as we move forward into this fourth age of SOF. Um, additionally, on the note of coming challenges for the future, the reemergence of great power conflict, MDO, and the rise of powerful state level adversaries. Um, when it comes to the information domain and UW, um, we do have a an advantage for a permanent position. I don't believe, nor do I find it reasonable that all information functions have to plan and be executed within solely within and solely within their stove pipes of excellence. Um, however, if we look at all these domains, what they have in common is that everyone else, everyone needs everyone else's support. So within the authorities and education piece, I would argue that it's beneficial for all entities within the soft domain to learn from one another and that the education piece is possibly what could alleviate the issues with authorities and doctrine. Um, even within this dynamic world, I would say that it is important um, for all professionals within the soft community, especially soft leaders to learn um, across the ranks and up and down. Um, now, this is not a new concept, but it's mainly to underscore the importance of education, collaboration, and synchronization to set conditions to fight and win 
within our current and future wars. And additionally, we can't forget our favorite social media and the digital domain, um, digital information that does have the potential to make or break any operation we could possibly think of. And why it takes a, a flag officer to approve a PAO message is because perception is reality. And um, a tweet can go around the world faster than um, anyone has the time to put on their shoes. I think that's how the saying goes. And But understandably, soft operators shape operations and geopolitical environments. But looking ahead, if we reimagine um, all domains within SOF, UW to include the digital sphere, the information domains and all the umbrellas and, and pathways within them um, and all the diversity that SOF has to offer, I would urge current and future leaders to support education um, as the foundation and for members of their formations, because quite possibly they could have a fresh perspective and solution to a problem that we thought could be so complex. And that is all I have pending any questions. Hey, thanks, Bo. A couple, a couple of things. First one is just a somewhat uh, humorous observation. So you're a self-described introvert working as a PAO, PAO. That seems to be slightly in tension with each other. Um, Actually, uh, the more serious question is you, you spoke earlier about uh, how you recommended or thought that the various elements of the of the information opera, uh, uh, enterprise, I apologize for using the wrong term, could do a better job of working outside their silos. Could you give us an example of when we did not work well together and then what could have been done uh, and how improved cross-silo organization, uh, our cooperation would have, would have uh, had a better result? Do you have an example you can give us? Yes, sir. I, I think I dropped off when you were speaking, but I think you would like an, a, an example of when cross-coordination and synchronization didn't work well, question yeah. mark? Yes. Okay. Okay. Um, so an example would be while I was deployed in Iraq um, as part of the CJ SODEF, and I was working as an imagery analyst at the time, and um, we had to create uh, some products and it was supposed to be a joint uh, a joint slash multinational operation, like I would say. And um, what it was, was we were trying to create these products and have everyone on the same page, but um, the Swiss wasn't talking to us and we weren't talking to Swiss and like, it just, it was a mess and all of that could have been alleviated if we just like slowed down and did the MDMP process together as two nations or and joint forces and just taking that extra time to synchronize and come up with the ideas together as a team vice everyone in their stovepipes. Does that make sense? Yes. Um... And actually, I got another follow-on, but I'm gonna I'm gonna preface it with a shameless plug for the Modern War Institute. About a year, year and a half ago, the MWI had a podcast with the Philippine uh, about the the Battle of Maraway in the Philippines, which was a massive urban urban fight that happened several years ago. And during the podcast, what came out was if we found out the Philippine Army actually developed social media information operators. They literally pulled them as they graduated from their version of AIT. They pulled them, pulled them our way, and they started doing social media stuff, which I'm not very good at. That's why I have teenage <laughs> kids. Is that something that the U.S. might want to consider either as an MOS or maybe an ASI on social media operators? Over. Yes, sir. So I think that is a fantastic idea, especially as we move forward and everyone and the formations are getting younger and younger. Like, I feel like I'm not hip with it and or cool anymore. Um, <laughs> but I think within the MI community or even within the soft community, that could be its own MOS. Um, that could be an ASI for Intel folks um, or um, or anyone within the information domain, PSYOP, CA, any type of, any type of those kind of guys. Because that is where a lot of, misinformation, disinformation does happen. And to be frank, uh, a lot of people don't take the extra time to do the research and to get to the bottom of things. They take a lot of things face value. And so that can post, that can be an issue moving forward where 
even if one word in a sentence is false, it's it's labeled as either mis or disinformation depending on the intent. So I, I do believe that is something that can be in the works and is that would be beneficial to not only like the soft community, but to the United States military as a whole. Over. Okay, thank you. Uh, all right, that's sort of the first round. We're, I'm going to exercise the moderator's prerogative. I'm going to have a directed question for each of the panelists. And it's going to be the same question, but you get to you get to pick your poison. For every one of the panelists, you're king for a day or queen for a day. You pick your poison. What educational opportunity would you mandate? What authority would you get for us? Or what doctrinal change would you make? And you can't pick one that you use already. So Keith, we already have you for data analysis and research design. So for you, in your case, I'd be looking for what authority, if you were king for a day, what authority would you get for soft or what doctrinal change? And then Chris, you've already addressed educational opportunities. Uh, if you can think of authority, if you can't, you can go back to another educational. But we're trying to get a little diversity here. We're trying to hit education, doctrine, and authority. So uh, Keith. You up first? Yes, sir. Um, so if I was going to make a structural change, I'll, I'll take those three, uh, you know, categories very broadly and just indicate that you're looking for a structural change uh, so that I can avoid answering the question directly and answer one that I would rather answer. Um, I will say that I would change uh, the training environment and specifically how we assess uh, unit proficiency uh, through the Joint Readiness Training Center, or the National Training Center, um, because I think that those have become very sort of fixed in time and the time frame that they're fixed within is the late 80s and the early 90s, and they need to be significantly modernized. And I'm not talking about integrating some small drones. I'm talking about a massive uh, reevaluation of how we assess units at the Joint Readiness and National Training Centers. Uh, and specifically, uh, thinking about uh, using them for more of a uh, center for innovation. Uh, so currently, you know, in my own experience, uh, you know, having been to both the NTC and the JRTC repeatedly uh, up through the battalion command level, uh, you know, it's very much a pro forma. You're going to go down there, you're going to indicate that you've done some training, and you're going to be graded based on your ability to, uh, you know, follow the Army, the applicable Army doctrine. I think it would be a much more interesting training environment if units were put into force-on-force -force scenarios, potentially not against a professionalized op for, but I mean, I'm actually talking about battalion versus battalion, uh, sort of live free play, um, where you could actually start to see uh, decisions being made and try, uh, you know, experimenting with different ways of doing business and then collecting that data uh, to reinform uh, how we approach, you know, sort of the, you know, conventional and special operations processes. Over. Yeah, thanks, Keith. And for, for the entire group, what I left off was, in addition to telling me if you were king for today, what change you would make, give me the reason why. And Keith, I think you hit it. So would it be fair for me to say that the training centers, you would, you would like them to be more centers of innovation and experimentation? Um, and secondly, my, my hat is off to you for displaying your resistance skills on answering the question you wanted and not the question asked. Over. Okay, over to uh, Tim. I'm going to make a recommendation for a doctrinal change, sir. And that's that there comes out of whether it's SOCOM, whether it's the joint staff, but a definition of staff expertise for special operations. That includes the interagency, reservists, contractors, civilians, uh, to help drive the supporting infrastructure and the enablers. And what's your reason for that? Because while the focus of um, books, novels, movies, uh, you know, the pointy end of the pointy end of the pointy end of the spear is important. Without the enablers, uh, you don't have the ability to conduct these missions. You know, in, in the green room, Christian, I'm going to steal what you were talking about, right? Forward deploying MTTs and, and sending folks to training. If we don't have that infrastructure to enable the development and growth of our people, of our, of our supporting function, of, of our enablers, 
you can be the best door kicker, AC-130 crew, whatever it is, I can't do all of the necessary functions to get you, uh, to get you there. And so what, you know, we, we talk about the backbone of the army being, uh, of the US military being the NCO Corps. I think the backbone of, at the combatant command level is the staff. It, it's not the deployable units, uh, it, it is the staff. And if you don't professionalize or, and professionalize implies that it's not professional now, but if you don't formalize what staff expertise looks like in doctrine, I think you, you've got a gap. Okay, thanks, Jim. Here's a, uh, an observation maybe from the Army point of view, since I know you've, you're coming from Marine One. What the Army has done is the Army is, is so you're, you're, while you started off the doctrinal change, you actually almost sound like a talent management or personal management type uh, problem that you've identified. One thing that the Army has done, and I can't say how well we do it managing it, but we, what we've, the Army has done is created a, a skill identifier uh, for soft support, uh, skill identifier K9. Uh, so I jokingly say it's it's the long tab for supporters. It's a way for the army to do a to do a talent management to find yeah I need an engineer but I need an engineer who's who has soft experience just because of the, of the unusualness of the mission we need to have someone with with some degree of uh, that's that's better tuned to the mission requirements. So maybe you said it more like a um, combination doctrine and personnel management. Right. So the army has that K nine ASI. The Marine Corps doesn't. There is nothing in my record other than somebody pulling, um, you know, kind of the master unit list that I've been with uh, that says I have any soft experience. So there's so, no way for the Marine Corps to track that sort of thing. Uh, as, as far as I know, not being, you know, a, an admin clerk and not knowing the full nuances of the system, having done polls for similar things uh, at a, you know, at a battalion level, very hard to do. Uh, that level of skill analysis across the force. Okay, thank you. And to, to keep pulling that thread and, and to sort of come out with a list of, of, uh, uh, of, the, of actionable things, is it, uh, to, not to put words in your mouth, but I'm putting words in your mouth. So you're almost like you're recommending that so that might be something SOCOM pushed with services at their annual or semi-annual SOCOM service meeting is pushing for some way of talent management, something a la K9, uh, the K9 ASI, some way for other services to track their their soft, their 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 soft um, soft capable non soft guys. I, I think so, sir. Okay. All right, great. Hey, thanks. Uh, we're gonna go over to Chris. Over to you. All right, sir. Uh, so, in addition to the low hanging fruit, which has already been discussed, that we routinely slap out of our partners' hands, uh, not to be too dramatic, but uh, the in addition to filling the courses which they offer us, which is, should be a no-brainer, uh, I'm going to go with training. Uh, we need to routinely integrate foreign partners into NTC and JRTC, not to, to steal too much from uh, my, my colleague, um, but specifically integrating uh, elements of foreign re or regional partners into those training environments that'll drive partner engagement skills. Uh, it'll teach coordination outside of the conceptual. Uh, you know, you won't have to invent a fake shake that you need to go coordinate with. It'll be an actual person from another country who speaks a different language with a different doctrine, and you have to achieve an object objective on the ground. You have to think outside your own cultural mindset. And again, that would have to, we would have to get outside of the this is how you execute this one task. There's only one way to skin this cat mentality. Uh, it will build the liaison with our foreign partners. Uh, and it'll not only do that, it'll establish personal ties. So some of my, I attended uh, the um, commander general, general staff in Brazil. And for some of my uh, classmates, I was the first real live American that they got to interact. with, And so they had their preconceptions about who I was and what I represented. And by attending school there, I was able to chip away at that. If we were able to do uh, or get them to participate in our stuff, to invite them, uh, that would be a direct example of, uh, of what we represent and how we do what we do. Um, so as in, for example, some of the first platoon exchanges from some regional partners, and I'm trying to be vague about it, um, at JRTC have just happened in the last three years. Uh, so maybe, maybe we're starting to realize the value of integrating uh, partners, regional partners, but as a addendum to what you mentioned about the, 
the launching the warheads on foreheads versus the I, I would say, as I said in the green room, how come we'll spend a million bucks to blow up a camel on the other side of the world, but we won't fund bringing our partners to our schools or fund going to other partner schools? And I yield. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Um, I want to applaud you. This is the third panelist in a row who has displayed outstanding SEER skills and not exactly answering the question I asked, but going with what they wanted. So well done. You've all gone to the circle of trust. Uh, Time to go to camp, slap you some more. Um, one observation on your NTC, JRTC, I think a, a, an interesting data point would be looking at JMRC because the downside of NTC and JRTC is they have the tyranny of distance. Other than the Western Hemisphere, no one's really close to those two training centers, but JMRC I think has a far different, if we were to look at their participation by foreign partners, has a very, very different number, but that's because they can deploy there in six hours. Uh, it's far, you know, the tyranny of distance just might be uh, might be might be hurting us, um, and I, I liked your point about these, the, the you being going down to Brazil. Of course, damn you for going to Brazil for a year. Uh, is the ability to create those informal informal bonds with people when you're the first American they've been exposed to professionally for their life that that that, that shapes perceptions. Okay, all right. Last, we'll go back to Mo. Mo, you're queen for a day. Uh, what authority? Uh, doctrinal change uh would you make if you were if you could make if you could push one through oh hi i'm back okay hello okay um so sorry about that so um if i was queen for a day um i think i would say that anyone new within the soft community or anyone even thinking about joining the soft community or fresh baby officers or soldiers, leaders, just be um, not necessarily thrown into the hot theater of, of the time, but I believe, and I have fully experienced that OJT and just getting that experience on the ground, in addition to the to courses offered within JSAL and, and whatever, um, excuse me, presented in the schoolhouse would be the most beneficial because you get that real world, real life experience. And like all of the other panel members have stated, you get that um, you have no choice but to engage and create those bonds and liaison and synchronize between whatever forces are on ground. Um, so that's what I would do. Um, because that's how I've learned, especially um, within six months at first group, I deployed. And then within four months as a public affairs officer, not formally school trained, I'm here in Eastern Europe doing all the cool things. So I think that's, that's probably the most beneficial um, in addition to what we've already discussed on this panel. Penny, any questions? Okay, thanks, Mo. Uh, what I'm going to do now is we have a couple questions in the chat window, so I'm going to pivot to them. Uh, the se second two are for the open panel, but the first one's for Tim Heck. So, Tim, by improving access for civilians, are you including contractors as well? There are more contractors than there are GS and uniformed service members. It would be prudent to include contractors, regulations, and, law and laws notwithstanding. Over. So the answer to that actually kind of sounds like an answer to your question, sir, what would I change? I, I think, you know, without getting into the nuances of contract management, where access to courses and access to education is uh, part of the contract between the government and the contractor, I, I think if we, regardless of who writes your paycheck, if, if we're asking you to be part of the enterprise, we have an obligation to educate you to be a better member in that enterprise. So absolutely, I'm including contractors in that. Uh, and that's gonna require, um, that is gonna require a, a, a reframing of, uh, of contract if that's gonna be the case. Okay, thanks Tim, that's, that's uh, I was jotting down as you were talking. And so what I jotted down would, would really be the change you would, that you're advocating is changing of contracts to include a training provision there saying, as a contractor in SOF, you, you will go through some types of, I'm being very, very quick and broad here. Uh, you will go through some types of training as a member of the SOF, as a SOF enterprise. 
I think so, right? So if you're going to be at a organization, you know, if you're going to be at SOCOM's headquarters, you're going to be at RSOC or wherever, uh, or RSOF, yeah, hey, you've got to go to that staff education fundamentals or foundations course. You know, same as everybody else in uniform or as a GS employee, because you're part of the team. And, and that extends further to our combined and joint partner or combined and in, in interagency partners as well. So if you're the Danish representative at, at SOCOM International, hey, I've got a seat for you in class. You know, you're the, you're, you're the State Department rep, you're the AID rep, but there's a seat for you in class and it's expected that you're gonna go because you are part of our team. Okay. Thanks, Tim. All right, I'm gonna go to question number two. This seems to be open for anyone. So uh, here's the question. There are more, there are more formations besides SOF in our military today doing partner engagement. For example, SFABs. Does SOF partner engagement need to change? And if so, how? And this is the open one. So for whoever wants to try to tackle this. Sir, I'll jump on that real quick. I mean, I think uh, the short answer is probably no. I think, uh, you know, just like there are multiple formations in the Army doing offensive operations, for example, conventional airborne units, 101st airborne, you know, air, air assault units and soft units, they all do broadly offensive operations in some way, shape or form. But the application in the end states are different for soft. And I think as we look at partner engagements from an SFAB perspective, the objectives and the purpose of that. Uh, may have some areas of intersection, but like the degree and the eliteness of the engagement and the types of units we're partnering with as SOF are probably uh, characteristically different. So I don't think that we, you know, I don't think the inclusion of the SFAB makes us, you know, and to my mind, the, the creation of the SFAB does not make me reevaluate the uh, utility of SOF in part, you know, in partner engagement. It does make me it does make me think, well, now we have a, a wider range, a broader continuum to look at uh, partner engagement and align forces according to specific skill sets and end states. Over. Thanks, Keith. Yeah, well, I, I, I was jumping to say something similar down, which is uh, if we were to train another nation's force, I'd want logisticians training logisticians and combo guys tra training, uh, training combo guys. Um, anyone else from the panel want to jump in? Okay, nothing heard. So I'm going to go to question number three. This is from Joseph Shepard. It's for the entire panel. In these foreign relations issues of training, oh, it's regarding foreign relations issues for, for training. If we use the dynamic of relationships broken down into language, sociopolitical, cultural, and even history, would it play better with regard to educational reform and SOF? I, I would say that the answer is clearly yes. Uh, it, it, the knowledge for the sake of knowledge uh, never hurts. And if it provides a broader context for understanding where the partner is coming from and where, how best we can achieve our goals and, and, and objectives in the relationship for the region, then it's a win. Uh, it, yeah. Uh, any other comments from the panel? Okay, nothing heard. I'm going to go to question number four. This is from Gavril Mikus. I apologize if I mispronounced the name. In curriculum terms, should we educate U.S. civilians from their early years in order to infuse a more disciplined view of American patriotism? I'm not sure if this is talking about U.S. DOD civilians or the U.S. civilian population writ large. I'd be curious to know what a more disciplined view of American patriotism means uh, in the context of this question. I, I think uh, you're absolutely correct. Uh, you know, patriotism, the beauty of patriotism in the United States is that it doesn't mean one thing. Maybe in more informed view of patriotism would be more appropriate all right gavril if you're uh, if you're still dialed in you heard the, the 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 return question from tim so if you have a clarification would you put that just put that in the chat window so i'm going to go to question five 
This is from Lieutenant Colonel Retired Eric Udoge. I apologize, I messed. Up. I know I messed up your last name. And the question is, PSYOP tends to be overlooked by JSAL for decades now with courses specific to the needs of planners. There are no specific courses after the initial officer course. Could a T TSOC influence an operation planners course be a means to close the gap? Not sure if we have any PSYOPers here. Mo, you might be the closest thing we have. <laughs> um, I'll take a stab at it. I am not a PSYOPer at all, but um, I do believe at the TSOC, so I used to work um, while I was in Hawaii, um, I do believe that a TSOC can um, influence that change. Let me make sure I'm answering um, the question. It, it, it could be a means. I, I don't think it's uh, um, the only means to close that gap, but it's a start and because it'll give you that a little bit of a, um, more education and get you ahead as opposed to just having a basic foundational course. And of course, um, self-education and learning from others, leaders and other people um, within the community will be helpful as well. Uh, I'll, I think, I'll um, oh, sorry, sir, go ahead. Yeah, so I, sir, I think there's a, you know, a bigger uh, macro point that uh, Lieutenant Colonel Joy is uh, raising, and, and that is specifically that SIOPS has been overlooked, right, and probably to our detriment. Uh, and I think that um, the emerging contestation for the information environment uh, through cyber and informational and social media uh, means is probably one of the most interesting features of, you know, sort of current war from my perspective. Uh, it's something that I'm following very closely. Um, this contestation for the cognitive domain uh, through information operations. And I mean, I think we're about to re-enter a golden era of psychological operations. So I think generally what I would suggest is that we need to be reconsidering the psychological enterprise uh, as a whole, not just integration into as an afterthought, uh, but like um, just a reimagination of what's possible given the proliferation of sources to inject into uh, the psychology of our adversaries. Over. Tim, did you also have something? So just looking at JSAO's current course catalog, there are two courses that talk about influence. One is an influ influence and special operations course. Unfortunately, the course description doesn't tell you what that's actually about. And then the second one is a soft influence and operations in the information environment pilot. Uh, and there's a lot more information here. And I think that's, you know, it talks about folks that are going to be a TSOC. So I think that JSAO is making a shift to that, but Colonel Carter's right. The, um, the opportunity to include PSYOPs from the beginning or as an important part of special operations and not just an afterthought is, is going to be crucial to making those educational ventures successful. Okay, hey, Keith, that was a... Oh, Keith, Keith and Tim, thanks both. That was a the great point about this is the golden age. That's probably a good way to put it with the technology has changed so much. And again, to put the shameless plug in for subscribe to the Modern Wars 2 podcast because you like, subscribe, tweet, and subtweet. It helps with our numbers. But it, 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 I still keep thinking of the Philippine Army developing its actual soldiers who were hitting the social media in the battle. They're doing social media ops constantly during the battle. That was their one... one uh, their one job. So if, if the U.S. is something, the something the U.S. is considering, we ha do have an ally and partner in the Philippines that has done this. It might be a, a start point to figure out what they did for this for this course. Uh, for the entire panel, we've got a restatement from question number four. This is uh, from Gavril. In curriculum terms, should we educate U.S. populate the U.S. population at large from their early years in order to infuse a more disciplined view of American patriotism and love of country? Does anyone uh, want to jump in and, and uh, add any more comments from what you had earlier? And I think, I think Chris nailed it. There's a variety of ways to view American patriotism, and that's kind of an amazing thing about our diverse and, and ideological non uh, non homogeneous society. Right? Civics lessons in high school are a requirement in many states. That, that this education is happening. Um, yeah. I, I, 
I think it's probably outside the scope of this forum to talk about how we educate the American people as a whole, though. Yeah, I think I think we're looking for tangibles that JSAL, uh, as the lead for SOCOM on 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 thinking change, can walk away with. Um, okay, I'm not scared uh, though. I'll take it. Go for it. Um, Pete. So, I mean, I think we have to be really cautious about what we expect from the public education system because the large part of education occurs uh, both through exposure to the world and through what happens in people's homes. And I do not want the primary school system to turn into re-education camps where they present a very whitewashed view of history uh, to achieve some really questionable end states. Over. Okay, uh, I'm checking. The, there's no new questions. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to do a quick recap on, a, on the main points that I jotted down. Um, so from, from Keith, what we had was really less of a what to think, but how to think with his emphasis on we should have more education on how to do data analysis and for the PhD's dream on research design and methodology that helps you understand the problem and also helps you with assessing what you've been doing. So it's really on how to think, not to think. Tim um, was really about making it more, bringing, bringing more perspectives into the educational institution with, again, my tongue in cheek, we should go from no colonel and sergeant major left behind uh, as the retirees to no colonel, FSO, sergeant major, case officer. We want to bring more experiences from across the national security uh, enterprise and have them teaching. That way they'll infuse those knowledge uh, into, into, this, into the student body. Uh, from Chris, uh, really pushing the, uh, we should be doing, sending our officers to foreign courses more and bringing, bringing foreign officers into our courses more. We should push it earlier. It shouldn't be something you do when you've hit your field grade level, but we should start infusing it at, at younger ages. Uh, from Mo, uh, gave a story, uh, an example of uh, improving, uh, working, working outside of, so not, not working just solely in your stovepipe, but working across stovepipes on, on getting out messaging. Uh, when we went to the second round, uh, Keith uh, avoided my question and said he wants a center of ex experimentation and innovation. Uh, Tim, avoiding my question, came up with talent management issue on how SOCOM might want to propose to all the services that they have a, an ASI K-9 type program so they can manage their soft, capable talent. Uh, Chris also avoided my question and, and said we should do more, bring in, bring in more foreign uh, allies and partners into NTC, JRTC. I counter what I think we're probably doing at JMRC because distance is much easier there. Um, and I think those are the main points. So with this point, I still know more for the question. So I'll turn it back to the panel. We have about seven minutes, uh, eight minutes left. Uh, any closing comments? Again, I'll, and I'll go in the same order as before. So Keith, any closing comments? I mean, I guess in closing, I would suggest that uh, the fourth age of soft is going to require a broad interdisciplinary approach to problem solving uh, and the variety and then the ability to incorporate data from multiple sources into a coherent, uh, you know, sort of actionable picture of uh, the operational environment. And through education, uh, that's going to require us to look deeply about uh, sort of our preconceived notions about what uh, undergraduate sort of uh, educational model leads to success. And it's going to have to force us to commit toward uh, giving soldiers and officers and non-commissioned officers a chance to refresh their education over the course of their career. Over. Thanks, Keith. Tim. I'm gonna concur with Colonel Carter and make sure that we add civilians, contractors, uh, interagency partners and our combined partners as well to that. Because like Chris said earlier, we don't do anything alone. Um, and you know, th there's an entire building down at SOCOM's headquarters full of international liaison folks. We have to include them in, in whatever we do when we're refining the fourth generation of SOF. All right, thanks. Chris? Uh, well, again, thank you, sir, for allowing me to, or having me in, to participate in this forum. Uh, I will close in saying it's our dime. Uh, how are we going to spend it? Uh, the question, if we can look beyond the return on investment for sending a person to a course and look at it in the broader context of investing in our people, uh, the, the return on investment isn't 
next month, next year. It'll be 10 years from now when you're in 06 and you know who you're talking to on the other end of the line, um, for instance. Thank you. All right, thank you, Mo. Oh, I think we lost. Oh, I think we lost Mo again. Okay, to, to recap that, because I like to recap everything. Um, I had said before, there's a body of academic literature that says when you have multiple perspectives, you tend to have better, better thinking, better analysis. And a lot of you actually repeated that. Keith came up from the educational point of view, said so education-wise, multidisciplinary educating people with multiple multiple disciplines should help us understand the problem better. Uh, help uh, and, and with research design, help help us understand the problem and figure out how to assess ourselves more. Tim, you are also multidisciplinary, but from the point of view of perspectives, you think that the we should be educating not just the soft guys, but everyone who's part of the enterprise who has a different perspective, they should be part of the educational program. Um, Chris, you guys like the, that's our dime. We, we, it's our dime and how do we spend it? Again, to put a shame, to, to take your point of view of, the ROI, return on investment for sending someone to a the the Brazilian version of the of the cabinet's career course is not the benefit today. It's the benefit in about ten years from now. And again, shameless plug for the Modern War Institute. We have have a series of articles and podcasts on Plan Colombia, where that was actually one of the big points that came away from it was Plan Colombia was very successful because roots that seeds that were planted 20, 15, 20 years before the event uh, of a rescue bore fruit twenty years later. So this is this is a this is playing a long game, uh, not looking for what how's it going to benefit uh, the national security apparatus or the country today, but it's we're planting seeds to have benefits years from now. Um, let's see, I don't see Mo back in. Okay, with that, um, any last uh, any alibis? Otherwise, we'll turn it back over with four minutes to go. Briefly, sir. Uh, so uh, I, I hate to use someone else's anecdote, uh, but uh, the, they said, well, it, it was a case of the, somebody at the uh, accounting department saying, you know, what if we spend money on this person and then they leave? And the counter to that argument was, well, what if we don't spend the money and they stay? Okay, I like that one. Any other alibis from the panel or any other alibis from the curator who's uh, monitoring the chat window? Okay, nothing seen or heard. Nothing seen or heard. Again, uh, to reiterate for everyone listening in, the, uh, everything you heard was the personal views of the panelists and not representative of their organization, SOCOM or the Department of Defense. And again, thanks to the to the Joint Special Operations University with uh, Dr. Wilson and uh, Charlie Fain, who is the the man behind organizing a lot of this stuff here. And with that, uh, this panel is closing, and we're giving three and a half minutes back for people to get a quick bite to eat before the next event. Over. Colonel Howell and panelists, really appreciate that insightful and wide-ranging discussion. Thank you so much for being with us today.